Uh, my name is Philip Mann and I am the technical officer for the Tropical Beef Technology Services uh, based in Rockhampton, Queensland. Your main presenter tonight is Andrew Byrne, who is the technical officer for Southern Beef Technology Services and based in Armadale, New South Wales. Uh, we also are privileged to, to have Dr. Mike Goddard online with us tonight to answer any of your, any of your questions. Uh, Mike is a professional fellow in animal genetics at the University of Melbourne, where he holds a joint appointment with the Victorian Department of Primary Industries. Uh, Mike is distinguished for his work in quantitative genetics and its application in agriculture. Mike's current research in his role as leader of the Victorian BPI and the Beef CRC genomic projects focuses on identification of bovine genes used by dairy farmers and beef producers. Tonight's webinar is titled DNA Technology, Understanding the Basics and is the first of the six topics we will be covering in the Know Your Genes uh, webinar course. At the same time, every Monday night over the next five weeks, we will be covering the other topics, which include DNA technology and uh, use of DNA technology in parent verification, uh, managing genetic disorders, changing type traits, and also improving production traits. We'll then finish off by looking at a cost-benefit analysis of using this technology in your herd. Uh, leading scientists from the BCRC and industry representatives will also be assisting with the presentation of these topics over the coming weeks. Thank you very much, Philip, and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's good to see a, a good crowd in tonight. Okay, so this is the, as Philip touched on in his uh, introduction there, this is the first session in this webinar course. And tonight, what I really aim to do is try and take you through some of the theory and the terminology, I guess, behind DNA technology. So, as I see it, DNA technology is really the, the next generation of technology which is going to be available to you as a beef seed stock producer. And I liken that, I suppose, to the generational change that we probably saw with the introduction of performance recording or later when we started to adopt some best linear uh, unbiased prediction, some BLUP type technology which is developed into breed plan today. So, with that next generation of technology, with these DNA-based technologies, there's a whole range of new concepts and new terminology that we have to get ahead around. And tonight's webinar is really to try and give you an introduction into some of that theory and that terminology um, when you start, so you have a, a good understanding of that when you start to look at applying some of these technologies within your herd. While we'll be doing a lot of theory tonight, uh, we will end on well, what are the kind of applications of this DNA technology within your seed stock enterprise. So, and that they will really form the basis of the next five sessions in this webinar course. So, that's really where we're heading tonight. It will be the most heavy uh, of any of the sessions in terms of the, the theory, uh, but it's really important that we cover some of the, the basics um, or the fundamentals behind the DNA-based technologies as the uh, grounding before we get into the applications of them. So as Philip said, I'd really encourage you as we go along to, to ask questions and obviously we have the benefit of, of Mike uh, Goddard online to, to answer those. So to start off with, I guess, in terms of uh, defining the theory of DNA, the obvious place that we need to start is at the, at the top question of, well, what is DNA? And when we've asked these uh, questions at the different field days and workshops that we've run around the country over the last couple of years, there's normally somebody in the audience who's very quick to put up and actually define what we're talking about when we say DNA. So that is... We can, we can expand that abbreviation out to deoxyribonucleic acid. And what does that tell us about what DNA is? Well, probably not much, but what it does tell us is that we're actually talking about a molecule. It's a real thing. It does exist, and it's something that's tangible. What's more relevant, I guess, when we start to look at well, what is DNA is how does it relate to the animals which you have running around your paddock. So if we have a, a Hereford bull there, what do, what do we mean when we start talking about its DNA? And to answer that question, I'd go through and actually start to break that animal down a bit more. So if we start to put that animal under the, the, micro, um, the microscope there or the magnifying glass, we, can, we need to consider that that animal is actually just a bundle of cells. That animal is made up of a whole lot of different types of cells, so across the skin and hair and 
uh, muscle and blood, etc. But really, if we consider that animal just to be a bundle of cells. And if we look there, we've, we've got a cell there in the magnifying glass. Um, and in the middle of that cell, we actually have um, a nucleus. And when we start to look further within that nucleus, we can see these things called chromosomes. So within each of the nucleus, um, or within each of the cells that make up that bull, there's a nucleus. Within each of those nucleuses, there basically are uh, these 30 pairs of chromosomes. So the, the animal there inherits one chromosome from its sire, and one chromosome from its dam, until it has those 30 different pairs. In humans, we have 23 different pairs, and different species all have a different uh, number of pairs of chromosomes. When we break the actual chromosomes down a bit more is where we start to see the DNA. So the chromosomes within the, the set nucleus of each of the cells that make up the animal are basically just bundles of DNA. So that's where, where we see it. If we, you look at your animals running around the paddock, that's what the DNA is that we're actually talking about. One of the more important questions probably is, is not well, what is DNA, but what is the role that it plays within that animal? And the key thing about DNA is it basically contains the genetic blueprint for the animal. Right? Another way of looking at that is it contains the instructions that um, determine how that living organism is formed, in this case the animal. So another way I guess of looking at that is it just contains the genes of the animal. And that's a very important point for us when we're in the beef seed stock world. It also leads us into that next question of well, we've seen there what DNA is, but what is actually a gene? And to answer that question, we will have a, um, a bit more of a look there at DNA in more detail. So we need to actually go in, we've seen where that DNA fits in the magnifying glass. We now need to go in and actually break that down and look at the structure of DNA. So we can start to talk about, well, what is a gene? What's a gene marker? And how do a lot of these DNA-based technologies work? So if we look here at um, the actual DNA in a bit more detail, we need to go into some of the chemical structure of that. So if we look and we consider that basically DNA is made up of these two strings of things called nucleotides. So we can see here, if I use my mouse and come down and show you, hopefully you can see that on your screen, but we have two different strings and they're bound together into that unique kind of uh, double helix formation that we associate with DNA. The important thing about the nucleotides is they're all comprised of a couple of, or three different uh, mole um, chemical formations. So if we look, the backbone of the actual uh, DNA is made up of a phosphate group and a sugar molecule. And that in itself is nothing unique when we start looking at these DNA-based technologies. But the important thing is the third component, which are the nitrogenous bases. So they are the, the bits in the middle, and they bind the two different strings together, and they form the basis of how a lot of our DNA technologies work. So those nitrogenous bases, as you can see in that diagram there, there's a, a range of different letters, the A, T's, and C's, and G's. What they refer to is in, in this... Um, the nucleotide structure, there are four different types of nitrogenous bases which exist, and they all have a slightly different chemical structure. So we look there at adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And the way their chemical structure works is that the A's and the T's always bind together, and the G's and the C's always bind together. So we have the, the structure of DNA there, the two strings of nucleotides, but the important component is the nitrogenous bases within them and which binds those two different strings together. Now if we consider an animal's DNA to actually just be a series of these different nucleotides, so all these nitrogenous base pairs I should say. So if we look across the animals, or the um, beef animal's DNA, it's estimated that there's approximately three billion of, the nu of these different nucleotides. So if you consider the animal's DNA the way it's been described to me, and I'm not sure how, how accurate it is, but it, it tells the story, is if you wrote out the animal's actual DNA sequence, so you, you looked at the sequence of A, T's, G's and C's, you put them on a piece of paper and you printed them out in size 10 font, that code of the animal or the, the DNA of the animal, the sequence, would run all the way from Perth in Western Australia across to Armidale uh, in northern New South Wales. So 
I'm not sure if that's the exact distance. I've never actually looked in checking it, but it, it tells a story to me that when we consider the DNA, we basically could look at it as a series of these G's, C's, T's and A's, all written together with no spaces between them. And those, the sequence of those um, nitrogen spaces actually set the instructions for how that animal or that living organism is formed, in this case, the, the beef animal. So if we then take that discussion and start to look, well, we understand a bit more about the structure of DNA, but what is a gene? The important thing to note is that these nitrogenous base pairs, the sequence of them actually differs between animals. And as I mentioned before, that sets the genetic code. And all a gene is, is where we have a particular spot within the DNA, and a particular base pair sequence will contain the instructions for that particular trait or for that particular uh, product. So if you consider, as I explained it, the nitrogenous base pairs, that code of GCs, Ts and As running between Armadale and Perth, what a gene may be, that there may be a particular base pair sitting somewhere around Adelaide, and whatever that base pair sequence is determines whether the animal has, or in this case we say a human, has blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes, etc. And the different um, sequence that they have will determine uh, what eye colour they def definitely have. If we look further, um, based on the, the research there, it's estimated that there's between 22,000 to 26,000 or 27,000 different genes in a beef animal. There'll be, be lots of them, we have no idea what they do, um, but when we look across those 3 billion nucleotides, there's possibly 22 to 27,000 different spots in that DNA um, which are actually associated or code for a specific product. That then leads us into the next question when we start going through some of the, this theory as to, well, we know what, a, what DNA is, we know what a gene is, but what is a gene marker when we start looking at that? And similarly, if we consider, and I, I say gene marker, there's a lot of DNA tests out there, or a lot of discussion which we've had about gene markers. What a gene marker is, it's not actually going in and looking at the gene itself, but it's just where we know a particular base pair sequence at a known location in the DNA is known to be associated with differences in the performance of animals for a particular trait. Now, we don't know whether that's the actual gene. It may be located, that sequence may be located within the gene, or may be simply associated with the gene, but all that we know is, so we don't necessarily know what the, what the actual uh, base pair sequence is that causes that different uh, performance, but we know that when an animal has that particular base pair sequence, it is associated with a difference in performance. So how they go out and discover these gene markers, so obviously they have a population of animals that they measure for a particular trait, so they've, they've got one population which may be very high performing for a trait, one population which may be very low performing for a trait, they analyse their DNA and say in this case they've gone through and identified that those animals that are very high performing actually have a T, C, A, T and G at that particular spot in the DNA versus the animals which are low performing have another different base pair sequence. And so then that becomes a bit of a gene marker or a marker for that particular trait so we could test another animal, go in, have a look at their DNA in that particular spot see whether they have a T, C, A, T and G and then make some assumptions about what the genes are that they carry for the trait that we've discovered the test in. Now when we start looking at some of our different DNA technologies that work on these gene markers, there are several different forms of gene markers which actually exist. And this is where some of the terminology will come through to you when you're talking to different commercial companies. They'll start quoting a whole lot of different uh, technical things behind their test and some of these basis forms of gene markers will help you to understand those. So the first form that we need to discuss is the one which is the, the basis for most of our production trait technology, which is referred to as a single nucleotide polymorphism, or a SMP as you see at the top, and that's kind of pronounced SNP, is that the lingo which tends to go with this. So in this case, you can see we have two different animals there, two, they're different DNA, so animal one up the top and animal two below that. Um, if we go through, you can see it, the particular SNP or the particular base pair that has been actually highlighted, the top animal has a C and a G, the animal down below has a T and an A, and so at one particular nucleotide we have a polymorphism, they are, they are different. And so that, in essence, 
is just one different gene marker, one former gene marker. Instead of looking at the string before where we had a T, C, A, T and G, in this case it's just one different nucleotide which is different, in this case the C and the G versus the T and the A. Now this kind of, um, as I was mentioned before, this kind of gene marker is the basis for all the traits that we have, at the, well, the tests that we have at the moment for production traits. So the latest production trait uh, probably has become available in Australia is the uh, 50K test that's marketed for the Angus breed by Pfizer. Now all that that test is doing is that actually is a 50, 50K or 50,000 SNP test. So it looks at the DNA of an Angus animal at 50,000 different spots for 50,000 different single nucleotide polymorphisms or 50,000 different SNPs. The research has been done to know what the association between each of those SNPs is with a particular trait of interest and it looks at the sum effect of those to come up with an estimation of the animal's genetics for each particular trait. So. The, the tests in the past, that, that's the latest test, uh, the test that preceded uh, that offered by Pfizer again as the, the major player in the Australian market was uh, a 56 SNP based test. So it's still the test which you can do for a lot of our tropical cattle and um, the southern breeds apart from Angus. So as this technology starts to progress we go into bigger and bigger kind of these SNP panels which look at more and more places in the animal's DNA at once and the latest panels that are starting to be used um, obviously up around 800,000 SNPs now and moving forward towards more full genome sequencing. The next form of um, gene marker that we'll look at is called a microsatellite. Now a microsatellite is the form of gene marker which tends to be the basis for our parentage verification. So SNPs more related at the moment to uh, production traits Traditionally, uh, parentage verification have worked on microsatellites. I should say some of the companies are now moving their parentage verification over to SNP-based technology. But what a microsatellite is, is rather than a difference in one particular uh, base pair, it's looking at these different uh, repeats of a particular base pair sequence. So at a particular spot in an animal's DNA, they will have a repeat of a base pair sequence over and over again. and length of that sequence actually differs between animals. So in this case on the screen here you can see there's a repeat of a, a CGAT, so there's a, a two base pair uh, sequence repeat there. The actual repeats which can exist are between say one and six base pairs. Um, and so what we see is say for example um, in this example that we've got there we might have one particular animal that at that spot in the DNA has 58 repeats of this CAGT combination uh, versus another animal may have 52 repeats. And so how the parentage verification looks at is it, it looks at how many repeats an animal has, then looks at the potential size for instance and looks and sees which of the size has the same number of repeats and starts to make some linkage between the calf and what the possible size could be. Now most of our parentage verification doesn't look at just, just one microsatellite, um, it actually looks at on average probably around 20 to 25 different microsatellites at once when it's doing its parentage verification and, and different companies will have different microsatellites that they use and a different number of microsatellites. So I guess we'll, we'll break for questions um, very shortly so just before we do I'll just go through I guess some summary take home message out of some of that theory because we've been through that fairly quickly and some of it's probably some quite new concepts to to most of you. Um, so if we look at what DNA is, the important thing to note is we have the animal running around the paddock, in this case the Hereford bull. That animal is made up of um, basically a bundle of cells. Within each of those cells there's a cell nucleus. Within the cell nucleus there are these 30 pairs of chromosomes and the chromosomes are just made up of bundles of DNA. And the important thing about the DNA is it contains the genetic blueprint for our animals and really controls their, their whole genetics. It contains all their genes and is everything probably what we're about in the beef seed stock enterprise. The next thing or take home message I'd give you out of this is when we start looking at the structure of DNA, DNA is made up of two strings of nucleotides. 
And those nucleotides have three different components, but the important one is the nitrogenous bases, which join together between the C and the G and the T and the A. And the sequence of those uh, base pairs actually differs between animals. And working with that difference in the sequence is the basis for all our DNA technology today. So that's a, a quick summary of some of the theory there. Um, I'll break now for questions, so I'll throw it back to you to Philip. Okay, thanks very much, Andrew. Um, you must have explained it all pretty well because I haven't got too many questions there at the moment. So certainly encourage everyone to have a think about a question to send in or the mic to answer. Um, one of the questions there is uh, just grueling if we have notes of tonight's presentation available. Um, as I will cover later, uh, the full presentation will be available to download on the SBTS and TBTS website. Um, there's one question there that uh, we'll get Mike to answer. Um, a couple more coming in. So, Mike, um, how how do mutations occur which exclude a carp as a progeny of a particular mate? Now, you, you should be right to go there, Mike. Did you get that question? Um, sorry, can you just repeat that? Uh Phil, I, the, your speech got cut off midway through. Sure. Our question is, um, how do mutations occur which exclude a calf as a progeny of a particular mating in the parent verification? Well, usually what happens is that uh, if the calf has got uh, 25 copies of those CNAs, and the sire doesn't have 25 copies on either of his chromosomes, then he can't really be the sire of that calf. The occasional mutation will happen so that the calf is different from his sire. But where that happens, it's, it's, un, it's very rare, and it will affect one of the microsatellites in the test, but it won't affect a whole bunch of them. So if the uh, the calf doesn't match the sire at a whole bunch of different microsatellites, it's not because of a mutation, it's because he's not really the sire. If there's only one microsatellite where the calf doesn't match the sire, it's possible that that's a mutation, but unlikely. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, we have another question here. Um, it's saying if, if there are 3 billion nucleotides and about 26,000 genes, do we assume that each gene has around 100,000 nucleotides or does it vary with uh, more complex traits? Well, the, the genes consist of two different uh, parts. There's a, in most genes, there's a, a a bunch of nucleotides that code for a protein. Uh, every three nucleotides codes for one amino acid in a protein. And that, that sequence of uh, bases of nucleotides that codes for protein only makes up about 1% of those three billion bases. So uh, there's a small part of the, of the DNA that contains a code that tells the animal what amino acids to put together into a protein, like hemoglobin or something. Um, surrounding that uh, uh, coding DNA, there's some DNA that regulates where the protein gets turned on and off. And uh, for example, in the case of hemoglobin, there'll be some DNA that says, Turn this blood, this protein on, this gene on, uh, when you're making red blood cells, and and that comprises uh, a bit more of the DNA. People don't know exactly how much of it is con concerned with with some form of regulation of the genes, and then there's some other DNA in between genes that may be just junk. It doesn't do anything useful. It just sits there. So we've got three 
sorts of DNA associated with those 26,000 genes, a little bit that actually codes for a protein, a bigger bit that's uh, regulating when that protein gets made and which cells it gets made in, and some junk DNA that doesn't appear to do anything. Okay, thanks very much, Paul. Um, a couple more questions there. Should we cover before we move on? Um, uh, the other question is: Is or is not a microsatellite a small piece on the end of a chromosome? No, it's it's not on the end of the chromosome necessarily. It can be anywhere in the chromosome. It's just a repeat, uh, like uh, Andrew showed, of uh, a couple of. Uh, bases over and over again, like CA, 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 but it can occur anywhere within a chromosome. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, one last question before we move on. Um, getting back to the parent verification and mutation, um, is the mutation for parent verification, well, if, the, if the mutation for parent verification excludes the dam, how is that explained when the dam is certain? Um, it, it dams are uh, not always as certain as people think. Um, the cows adopt calves that weren't their own. I guess if you pulled the calf out and uh, you know you were sure that this calf came out of this cow, um, then uh, there could be a mutation which is called uh, caused that calf to. Um, be rejected as coming from that particular cow. That would be an unusual event though. Um, a, a much more likely event in, in practice is that the calves and cows got mixed up at birth and uh, although when you saw them this calf belonged to that cow, it wasn't actually born to that cow. Okay, thanks very much, Mike. Um, I think we might move on and um, take, take more questions at the next break. Okay, thank you, Philip. And uh, now I'm seeing why we've got Mike in attendance because uh, I think he did a far better job of that than what I can. I'm also very glad he didn't start with a whole lot of corrections to my previous, uh, previous little session. So uh, one other thing, I will just add uh, one comment on... Um, one of those questions about are notes from tonight's presentation available? Uh, we don't have notes specifically, but if anybody would like a copy of the presentation um, of the slides, I can actually, if you email uh, into your different SBTS technical officer or TBTS technical officer, um, then they can email you a copy of those. Um, okay, so we'll get back on to the, the different presentation now. Um, the next thing that I want to cover with you is start looking at some common kind of DNA tech terminology. So one of the things which I've struggled with when starting to look at, at DNA is when you talk to the different scientists or different commercial providers, they can often be accused, I think, of speaking a different language, a whole lot of different terms which you, you tend to lose them in conversation uh, just because of the terms that we're using. So we'll go through now and, and start to just cover, I guess, a definition for some of those different terms. The first one, which you'll often hear, is an allele. So what are we talking about when we start talking about alleles? And to explain that, I'd ask you to remember that what we said was each of the beef animals actually has 30 pairs of chromosomes and they've inherited one from their sire and one from their dam. And what that means is because the actual chromosome contains the DNA and the DNA contains the genes, they actually inherit two different copies of each gene, one from the sire and one from the dam. And when we start looking at the alleles, we're just really referring to the different forms of the gene. So in this case, I've put an example up there of a, a capital P and a little p. We might refer to that to be, say, the, the gene for the polled, um, for polled trait in cattle. And the big P we'll refer to in this case as maybe the polled form of the gene and the little p being the horned form of the gene. So all we'd be saying is the big P is the, the polled allele and or the, the polled form of the gene, and the little p is the horned allele, or the horned form of the gene. 
That then leads us into some other kind of terms which often get uh, put up in these discussions. And the first two we'll look, talk about are homozygous and heterozygous. So what are we referring to when people refer to those two things? The first thing to note, well, homozygous is basically the two forms of the gene that they've inherited or the two alleles that they, they have are identical. So in the, the horned polled case that we've got, the first animal here would be considered to be homozygous polled because the two alleles that it has for that particular gene, the one that got from its sire, the one from its dam, were both polled. Or vice versa, we could look at two little p's being two lowercase p's there, um, indicating that the animal would be homozygous horned. So both alleles that they got from the sire and the dam were the horned allele. If we change tack and start talking about heterozygous, it's just those animals that are heterozygous have actually the two uh, alleles that they've inherited are different. So the two different forms that they've got, one from the sire, one from the dam, are different. In this case, they may have got from the sire or the dam one copy of the polled allele and or from the um, sire or the dam, the other version that they got might actually be the horned allele. So in those cases, we often refer to homozygous, heterozygous. That's exactly what we're talking about. We're just talking about the two alleles that they have, whether they're the same or they're different. The next bit of terminology which often comes associated with this is dominance, dominant and recessive. So when we start looking at this, we're really starting to look at, well, how do the different um, gen or alleles actually interact together? So in the case of an heterozygous animal above, it's got a, uh, one copy of the polled allele, one copy of the horned allele, and the key question is, well, is that animal horned or is that animal polled? And it really depends on the actual gene in question and whether it is this dominant or recessive type mode of, um, of inheritance. So if we start looking at the horned and polled one as the example, then we know that the polled allele is dominant over the horned allele, which is considered to be recessive. So in this case, where we have a one copy of a polled, one copy of a horned, then we'd expect the animal to actually be polled. Now it gets more, more um, complicated than that in practice because SCURS starts to come into play as a separate gene, but we, we won't complicate at this stage. Um, so dominant and recessive, we're really just starting to look at, well, how do those different alleles that interact together? In this case, we'd say that poll was completely dominant over uh, horns. We don't necessarily have complete dominance, so if we start looking at some of our coat colour, um, there's, there's some incomplete dominance, so if we use shorthorn as the example, we might have red shorthorn and, and white shorthorn, so we've got the two different alleles there. When they're heterozygous, they may actually have some kind of incomplete dominance, so the animal may act itself be roan, a combination of the both. So how those animals, um, or what the, the actual uh, animal appears, will really depend on the actual mode of in, uh, dominance and recessive and the mode of inheritance that we have. The next kind of term which tends to get associated with this concept is that of a carrier animal. So what we're really looking at here when we start talking about carrier animals, and it often refers to or is used in the, when we're starting to look at uh, genetic defects, but we can consider, it using our horn polled example, um, what we're referring to really is these heterozygous animals who may appear one way but carry genes for the other form. So in this case we had a heterozygous animal, it might be polled, but it's actually carrying um, a gene or a horn form of that allele. In the case of the, the genetic defects, it's normally animals which are normal, they don't have the genetic defect, but they're actually carrying a form of the allele which when mated to another carrier, if by chance they both pass on that um, the allele associated with the genetic defect and the calf inherits both copies of those, then it may express that genetic defect. So we start looking at carriers, that's what we're looking at, the actual allele, which might not be expressed, but uh, codes for a particular trait. The next bit of uh, terminology which we've got, um, which some which might be more familiar to you, but is important to go through and cover, is this concept of genotype and phenotype. So when we start looking at genotype, we're actually starting to look at the genetic makeup of the animal. So basically we're looking within the animal's DNA at its specific combination of alleles. So if we're using our, our horn polled example, its genotype would be whether it was homozygous polled, heterozygous, 
or homozygous horned as per the, the upper case P's and the lower case P's. Phenotype on the other case is not so much what the actual genetics of the animal is or what's contained in its DNA, but the physical appearance of the animal. So in the case of the horned polled would be whether the animal has horns, whether it's polled or whether it's skirt. So um, really phenotypes looking at, at what we see and genotype is, is the combination of alleles or the, the genes of the animal. Where we start to really get into differences between genotype and phenotype is more in our production traits. So that tends to be where, where we see it. Um, and those, those kind of traits which are more influenced by the interaction with the environment. So we might have, say, two animals with exactly the same genotype for weight gain, um, but may have totally different phenotype, um, so actually weigh totally differently depending on the environment in which they've been run. If some have been born in fairly tough conditions, others might have been looked after. They might have exactly the same genotype or exactly the same genes, but a totally different performance for that particular trait. And that becomes quite relevant when we start to look at our breeding animals and selection of breeding animals, that what we're really interested in is actually the genotype of the animal, because that's the part which is passed on to the progeny. So when we're looking at breeding animals and selecting them, we want animals with the best genotype, not so much the best phenotype. And in the past, we've had to go through and use things like our um, breed plan analysis and thing to take those phenotypes and estimate what that genotype is. We start looking at DNA technology, we're just basically going in um, and starting to measure that genotype directly. So that's where the concept of genotype and phenotype fits in. So that was just a quick overview of some of the terminology. Uh, I see there's quite a few questions which have come in, so I'll hand back to you, Philip, now to answer those. Right, thanks very much, Sir Andrew. Um, there's a few few questions come in, uh, mostly related to your previous previous session. So, if anyone's got um, some questions on the uh, DNA terminology, um, please send them in. Um, just while we're waiting for those, I've just got a couple of questions here from Mike. Um, first one is: Is SNP or SNP technology, SNP technology, superior to micro satellite technology for parent verification? No, it's it's not really superior, but it's going to be a lot more convenient in the future. Um, the the SNP assay is easier to do than the microsatellites, and we're going to be doing SNP assays for for other purposes. So we don't want to be doing microsatellites just for uh, parenting. So it the 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 future is in using the SNP assays to do everything, um, parentage, production traits, tests for carriers of abnormalities, etc. Um, we can actually do a better job with SNPs than with microsatellites for parentage because we could have so many SNPs. You know, when you've got 50,000 of them, for instance, um, then you don't see one SNP that, uh, that tells you that this sire isn't really the, the sire of the calf. You, you see thousands of them. Uh, and so uh, it's very easy to pick calves that aren't by the putative sire if you've got 50,000 SNPs. Now, you wouldn't do 50,000 just to uh, for parentage, but you might be doing that anyway and you get the parentage information almost as a byproduct of, of other tests that you're doing. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, another question we have there is: um, Is every chromosome inherited from the sire, or alternatively from the dam, exactly the same? Uh, say for example, are the well, 15 or 30 are the 30 from the dam exactly the same as the 30 from the sire? Um, well. They're, they're the same in the sense that they're all chromosomes. They're, they're different, of course, in the alleles that they carry. Um, a calf might get a horned allele from its mother and a polled allele from its sire. And they're part, those alleles are part of the chromosome. So in that sense, the, the chromosome coming from the mother and the father is different. The other way in which they're different is that there's one pair of chromosomes that control the sex of the calf. Uh, if you get 
two X chromosomes, you're a, a female. If you get an X and a Y, you're a male. And you could only get a Y from your sire. Sires either pass on an X or a Y, whereas the, the cows always pass on an X. So the, uh, you, if you're a bull calf, then you got a Y chromosome from your dad and you got an X chromosome from your mother. And that's another way in which the, the chromosomes coming from the mum and dad are different. But looked at grossly, we all get one copy of each chromosome from our mother and one copy from our father. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, another question I have here is, uh, do same-sex twins have, gene com have the same gene combinations uh, sometimes, always, or never? Uh, calves are the same as people. You can either have identical twins or you can have non-identical twins. Uh, generally, they're non-identical. Um, the way in which you get identical twins in any species is that you, you had a single embryo which is split in half, and that means that uh, both twins then have exactly the same genotypes at, at every gene. Uh, the more usual thing is that the, the, car, the cow shed two eggs and they got fertilized by two different sperm and so the the two twins are like two brothers or two sisters. Okay, thanks Mark. Um, in practical terms in practical terms, how how will the technology move from eight hundred K chips to whole genome scans? Uh, I guess you mean to hold genome sequencing, um, yeah. and the what's happening there is that the, the the sequencing of the whole genome, that's all three billion bases, is getting cheaper and cheaper, and so it will be possible in uh, a couple of years to have a large database of cattle which have been completely sequenced every. Every base of the three billion bases is known. And then it will be possible to genotype a, a, an animal at, the, say, the 50,000 uh, bases or 50,000 SNPs or, or 800,000 SNPs. And by reference to this uh, database of fully sequenced animals, we'll be able to work out what the full sequence is of your little calf that's got 800,000 SNPs genotyped on it. Uh, and the advantages of, of being able to work out the full genome sequence is that uh, mutations that are not part of the 800,000 SNPs or the 50,000 SNPs will be contained in the full genome sequence. So if a, if a calf has a, um, a mutation that causes uh, some genetic abnormality, you'll be able to see that in the sequence, even though that particular position on the chromosome wasn't included in the 800,000 SNP. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. I'll we'll just take one more question before moving on. Um, uh, Andrew, you might like to answer this one, or, or Mike. But given that multiple alleles may be responsible for a observed phenotype in various combinations, such as in complex inheritance, how useful are they in selecting for inherited traits? Andrew, oh. did you want to answer that one? Uh, no, I'll leave Mike to answer that one. Hey. Okay, <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not quite sure what the question's asking. There are some uh, genes where instead of just having two alleles like Andrew uh, illustrated for horns and poles, there are multiple alleles. Um, it, some of the genes that control coat colour, for example, uh, there are a series of alleles that might cause an increasing amount of white spotting. Now, most of our beef breeds uh, don't have any of these, but, but uh, the Holsteins do. Uh, so they're, 
might be a series of alleles that give you more and more white spotting. Um, but that's still useful if, if you, in the case of white spotting, of course, it's easy just to look at the calf and see how many white spots it's got. But suppose this was a trait that wasn't so easy to look at, uh, knowing which alleles it had at the white spotting gene would still help you to select for, for more or less white spotting, whatever it is you wanted. So the, the fact that you have multiple alleles doesn't really change the usefulness of the test. All right, thanks very much, Mike. I think we, uh, we might move on. Um, there are a few more questions there, but we're running out of time. But uh, anyway, Andrew, if you could continue on, we'll um, see how we go at the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Philip. Uh, so. What we're going to do now is just change tack. Obviously, we've been in some fairly heavy theory um, so far. So really what I want to now just start to look at is, well, what are the applications of this technology, just to finish off? So the, the first question, which when we start talking in, at this kind of level that seed stock producers often ask is, well, I'm a, I'm a beef producer. Why do I need to know all of this theory? And I, I kind of touched on it at the start that, we're now starting to see this next generation of technologies become available um, and there's a range of those that are on the market at the moment and a whole multitude of others which are likely to hit the market over the coming years. And as a beef producer, um, we're sitting there, we're going to have a range of different people come and talk to us about these different applications and actually understanding some of the theory that we've talked about tonight will really help you or put you in a position to A, be able to understand the actual brochures and the terminology that they use in those brochures, but more importantly, to actually go through and start to make some decisions and be in an informed position when you make these decisions about whether you actually invest in these technologies. So one of the things which you've seen or one of the limitations at the moment to the uptake of a lot of these technologies is the cost of them. So it's going to be quite a big investment, although the cost is coming down quite quickly. And so just understanding some of the theory, understanding how the actual different technologies are working will really place you in, in quite an informed position. So if we start now talking about, well, what are the applications that we possibly have for these DNA-based technologies? And I'll cover this very briefly tonight, but obviously this will be the basis for all the, the next couple of sessions, the next five sessions in this series. So the first thing, the things which are currently available, um, and we've touched on a lot of these tonight already, but the kind of applications which we have, firstly, say, for parentage verification, um, sire verification or full sire and dam verification. Um, the management of genetic conditions, obviously DNA has been widely used now by quite a few different breeds to actually go through and identify animals which are carriers for particular genetic conditions. Um, we're starting to see a range of different uh, tests coming out now for the, the genotype of the animal for different what I'm calling type traits. So in this case the two which we've had on the market now for a little while are coat colour and poldness, and I guess that the poldness one, there's been a few tests available in the US, but now there's the, the new beef CRC developed one, which has been released about 12 months ago and is available for the University of Queensland, which we'll talk about in one of the future webinars. Uh, but we're starting to see some tests that can go in and really help us look at what the genotype of the animal is rather than working on phenotype. Um, the next kind of range, and there are some tests available uh, through a couple of different companies now, uh, these tests relating to the production traits. Um, so we have tests available in Australia through Pfizer. Um, there's tests available overseas through Merial or Igenity uh, in the US. So these are really an area which is under a major amount of research at the moment and it's probably still a, a work in progress. Um, and the power of these tools for production traits just keeps, to, keeps improving. Um, some of the other more novel ways, I guess, of using DNA technology is when we start to look at assessing breed composition. So within some of our brand of beef products, um, actually using the DNA technology to go through and actually assess that um, if it's a branded product for a particular breed, that it actually is meat from that particular breed, or an animal of that particular breed. So that's just a snapshot of, of what I know is available. There, I'm sure um, there are probably other things available, but they're the, the main ones which I can see. Um, so already a range of different uses that you have potentially for applying these within your herd. More importantly, probably if we start to look in the future, um, just to give you a bit of a snapshot, 
I think when we start looking at this DNA technologies, the possibilities are quite endless as to how this technology could be applied. Um, very recently, both Philip and myself uh, were at a conference which Mike was fairly heavily involved in presenting, uh, facilitated by the Beef CRC, where scientists from around the world discussed their ideas for how DNA technology could be applied in the future. And scientists being scientists, they were very uh, excited about potential different applications and really it was just quite mind-boggling for where this technology might lead. Some of the examples I've just put up there, I've just plucked two. Um, but say just enhanced parentage verification, so at the moment we're just looking at what a sire and a dam is. Some of the talk now is, well, whether we'd be able to look at a, the DNA sample on an animal and get a full, say, three generation pedigree, sire pedigree on that particular animal just from looking at its DNA. Next kind of applications are really starting to then look more at the DNA of animals and start to enhance our mate selection. So rather than just using animals of a particular different breed, actually starting to look at how we can potentially select different animals to actually maximise our heterosis, so our, um, the variation in our genetics by looking at their DNA. Likewise, how can we use it to minimise inbreeding and things like that. So I think the possibilities in the future um, are, are quite uh, daunting in terms of how it can be. There's, it's going to be quite a powerful tool, not in the next couple of years, but certainly if we start to look at this technology in 15, 20 years down the track. So, But the, the first five points up there are certainly what's available, and that's what we'll be concentrating on um, moving forward throughout the rest of this webinar course as to particularly parentage verification, management of genetic conditions, the changing type traits, and genetic improvement of the production traits, how you can apply those, what's available now, and the kind of thought process that you can go through when you start to invest in those. So that'll uh, pull me up for tonight. Um, I think I'll hand over now for some further questions, but this will probably be the last time you hear from me. So I'd like to just, first of all, thank you all for your attendance, and thank you, Philip and Mike, for your contribution. Philip. Okay, thanks a lot, Andrew. Um, yeah, we've got a few, few questions there. We'll try and get answer a couple. We are running a bit, of, a bit out of time, but um, just quickly, Mike, if you could uh, just uh, answer a couple of questions. Um, does male DNA contain more junk or inactive DNA per chromosome than female DNA? And if so, what impact does this have on the project? Uh, well, I, I talked before about the Y chromosome and the X chromosome. Now, males have got one X and one Y. And the Y is a little chromosome that has very few real genes on it. Uh, so it contains genes that are important for making the, the fetus a male, but it has a lot of junk. Whereas the X chromosome has got lots of genes on it for all sorts of different uh, proteins. Uh, so the female has two copies, two Xs. So for lots of genes, she's got two copies, just like all the other genes in the body. But the poor old male, for, a, for the genes that are on the X chromosome only, the male's only got one copy because the, the Y chromosome doesn't have a copy of, of a lot of these genes. Uh, a classic case is the gene that causes colour blindness in people. It's on the X chromosome and so the uh, women have got two copies. Males have only got one copy. And so if they get one copy that's no good, they suffer from colour blindness. Whereas if a woman gets uh, one copy that's no good, but one copy that's okay, then she doesn't suffer from colour blindness. So colour blindness is much more common in men than in women. Um, there's a, a number of other uh, traits that are on the X chromosome, and so the the male is more likely to suffer from these things than, than the female. Uh, another famous one in, um, in people is haemophilia, where one form of haemophilia is, is on the X chromosome, so it's usually the, the boys who, who suffer from that. Okay, thanks Mike. Um, and just one other one, or one or two possibly, but one other one you might like, like to comment on quickly, um, which probably leads in nicely to our presentations in the coming weeks, but 
Are the gene markers, the SNPs, uh, consistent between breeds, the Bosturus, uh, Bosinex and European breeds? Well, a lot of the SNPs occur in multiple breeds. Uh, so the, the same SNP is there on the chip and it works in Herefords and it works in Angus as far as it, you know, it varies in both breeds. But what we found so far is that there might be a, a SNP, let's say it's a, a CG SNP, um, one allele is C and one allele is G, and in, in Angus, the C allele gives you more marbling than the G allele. If it works in Angus, that's not to say that it will work in Herefords and Shorthorns and everything else. So uh, that's why Pfizer have released a test which is specifically an Angus test because the, the same things that, that indicate uh, good traits in Angus, the same SNP alleles that indicate good traits in Angus don't necessarily indicate good traits in other, uh, in other breeds. We seem to have some background noise there somewhere. Right, okay, thanks very much, Mike. Um, just one last question, just quickly, I guess. Um, there have been a couple of questions in terms of fertility of twins, um, so the female or f fertility of the um, heifers, twin heifers, or uh, female and male calf horns twins in terms of their fertility. Well, the only case where there's a problem is where there's a, a, a male and female co twin. And the, the female is likely to be what's called a free marten, and that's because of the, the, the joint circulation of blood from one uh, uh, twin to the other inside their mother in, the, in utero. Uh, and this stuffs up the uh, development of the, the heifer calf and makes her infertile. So very often when a heifer is born co-twin to a bull calf, the, the heifer will be infertile, and a so-called free mark. But if there's two heifer calves, well, it's no problem. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Mike.